Okay, our first speaker tonight is Heather Burns, and she can carry on. Hey, hello. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. Can you hear me, James? You need me to speak up? Okay. Not even sure if this is on. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me out. James, can you all hear me now? Is everyone alive back there? I know you're close to the beer. Um, I've not even started yet. Sake, yeah. Okay, is it on? It might not be on the flight to you. Okay, right. So I've come over from Glasgow to the dark side today to talk about transatlantic tech and Trump. No wonder you're all drinking. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I will caution you beforehand that I'm not a lawyer and none of what I'm going to talk about tonight should be taken as legal advice. We should also have a little bit of time at the end for questions. However, I do need to leave a bit sharpish. Thank you very much, Scott Rail. So if I don't get to your questions at the end, please come see me in the hallway afterwards. That's no disrespect intended to the next speaker. So we're going to talk about what Donald Trump and his presidency mean for all of us on a policy level as technology and digital professionals. And this is why we can't have nice things, okay? <laughs> is this slide a code violation, by the way? <laughs> Perhaps it should be. Um, at this time last year, when I was, was um, working on digital policy issues, they were on very much a micro level. Really specific things like certain provisions of accessibility law, certain provisions of privacy law, they were down here. In the space of a year, we have just completely fallen down this rabbit hole that really has no precedence amongst other industries in terms of the very legal and political foundations that have enabled our industry to exist being shaken up. And the scary thing is they're actually they're, they're very similar. In the UK we have Brexit which has raised issues of data protection and data adequacy and data flows to Europe and the rest of the world in the freedom of movement of data, what we can send and how we can send it. There's also questions about the freedom of movement of tech talent. I, it's really nice to be back here at Skyscanner. I helped to um, organize a conference here once, and it's, it's like the United Nations walking through the office. You hear a dozen different languages, and that's been made possible by the freedom of movement. And that is now not something that we can always count on. In the UK, there's also the specific issue of the digital single market which are, is our involvement in the European Union's wider strategy for creating a single market throughout Europe in terms of e-commerce and copyright and VAT and taxation. Um, the whole idea of the internet was that it was borderless and wallless, and here we are walling ourselves off from that strategy. And that was just last year, and then we have number 45 in the U.S. who is raising issues of data protection, funny that, in terms of what data is captured and shared and used about individuals, in terms of the freedom of movement of data, whether the United States is going to continue to honor the policies and the systems that have protected European data, the freedom of movement of tech talent, as we've, so, we've seen so horribly in the past fortnight, and the specific issue that worries me that we're going to talk about, uh, which was not one I would have even predicted six months ago was net neutrality. So we're going to get into a little overview of specific policy issues from where I see it that I am keeping an eye on that I feel that we as digital industry professionals need to be aware of. The first is user defense, what I call small d data, small p protection. We'll deal with capital D, capital P data protection shortly. But during his campaign, Donald Trump said this, and I quote, and God, what I want is a watch list. I want surveillance programs. Obviously, there are a lot of problems, but certainly I would want to have a database for the refugees, for the Syrian refugees that are coming in because nobody knows where they're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the coherent paragraph. You should have read the three that came before that. It wasn't even coherent English servers in Ireland. It was for a narcotics case. And the judge said, this is not an issue of national security. You don't need that data. 
So the Second Court of New York struck it down. Very shortly after that, the, Fed, the Circuit Court in Philadelphia ruled that Google did have to comply with a government warrant to, to produce emails stored overseas for a fraud investigation. So we've had two circuit courts give completely opposite answers to two tech giants on the exact same question. Well, does, what does that mean where Donald Trump is concerned? It means the U.S. government is now filing litigation to pursue overseas data in the judicial districts that aren't bound to the Second Circuit Court. In other words, they're going to the judges that are going to tell them what they want to hear. We also know that targeted groups may now be asked to provide social media passwords and profiles at the border. We knew beforehand they were talking about putting your social media profile addresses on your visa applications. Now they want your passwords. And what do they mean by targeted groups? This um, is a post that's been going around today. It's a screen grab from Facebook. Sorry for the absence. On my way home from the U.S. last weekend, I was detained by Homeland Security and held with others who were stranded under the Muslim ban. Customs and Border Patrol officers seized my phone and wouldn't release me until I gave my access pin for them to copy the data. I initially refused since it's a JPL-issued phone, Jet Propulsion Lab property and I must protect access. Just to be clear, I am a U.S.-born citizen and NASA engineer traveling with a valid U.S. passport. Once they took both my phone and the access pin, they returned me to the holding area with the cots and other sleeping detainees until they finished copying my data. I'm back home and JPL has been running forensics on the phone to determine what Customs and Border Patrol and Homeland Security might have taken or whether they installed anything on the device. I've also been working with a JPL legal counsel. I removed my Facebook page until I was sure this account wasn't also compromised by the intrusion into my phone and connected apps. I hope no one was worried. JPL issued me a new phone and a new phone number, which I'll give out soon. This is federal government agencies at war with each other. This is a US citizen working for NASA, having their phone confiscated by Homeland Security. Now, as programmers and developers, I don't want you to sit there and read this and think, oh God, that's horrible. I want the wheels in your head to start turning, thinking, what can I do about this? And I'm going to talk about that later. Second issue I've had my eye on is what I said, capital D, capital P, protection, privacy shield. If you don't know what that is, that is the mechanism for supporting U.S. companies which collect large amounts of data on European citizens, ensuring that they are, as they're legally obliged to do, keep that data to EU data protection standards. That is part of the EU data protection regulation of 1995, and it's part of GDPR, which is the complete overhaul of the data protection regulation, which is on the books now but becomes enforceable in May 2018. If you don't know about GDPR, get on it right now. GDPR was going to take up my whole year before Donald Trump came along. Um, and right after he came into office, uh, Donald Trump issued his executive order enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States, which said, Privacy Act, agencies shall, to the extent consistent with applicable law, ensure that their privacy policies exclude persons who are not United States citizens or lawful permanent residents from the protections of the Privacy Act regarding personal identifiable information. So what he's basically done here is, is, is put an executive order that alters uh, an, Obama era, an Obama era amendment to a 1974 law that ensures better data privacy protection for non-US citizens in the US and said, whatever, it's mine, you have no protection. The safeguard for that was supposed to be the Judicial Redress Act of 2015, which extended those privacy <coughs> protections to the EU and its member states, except for the UK and Denmark. And this is where Brexit really starts to annoy me, is that we have taken our eye off the ball so badly, navel-gazing, that we're missing out on the big picture here. Now, the European Union was made aware of this, and their reaction is basically that. The person who's in charge of this says she wants to have a meeting with Donald Trump as soon as possible to clarify matters. 
And I'm thinking, yeah, good luck with that, Hen. Um, the thing about Privacy Shield, it, it was very fragile. It was never perfect. It was very flawed. But it was a working compromise born out of agreeing to disagree and finding a way to move forward with that. We now have someone in charge who doesn't believe in agreeing to disagree. We now have someone in charge who doesn't believe in finding a working compromise and going forward from that. So it is entirely possible in the next six months that the fundamental agreement governing data transfers between Europe and the United States will collapse. And that affects everything from the data flowing on those computers over there to your phones, which are cloud syncing all your data right now to storage in America. And this is something we all need to keep an eye on. Along with that, we have the threat to freedom of movement of tech talent. To give some background about this, you, you may have seen there was a really weird meeting in December where um, Donald Trump summoned the heads of all the tech companies to literally sit around the table. And it, it was something they all sort of did really reluctantly, but they felt a need to, to do along, to go along and sit with this. And Ivanka was at the table too. Okay. Um, and I think the, the impression I got reading the coverage was a lot of the, the tech leaders, the Sheryl Sandbergs, the Tim Cooks, walked out of that meeting cautiously optimistic that maybe it won't be so bad. And then we had the past two weeks with the Muslim ban. Insert obligatory mention of Steve Jobs, who was the son of a Syrian, uh, I don't know if it was a refugee or was he adopted, but Steve Jobs himself would have been affected by the ban. In response to that, there's all sorts of legal action going on. And the reason I was checking my phone until 20 seconds before I came up is because we're expecting a legal judgment to be made on the ban, like right now, like literally right now. But 96 tech companies signed an amicus brief to the case that we're writing uh, that we're, wait, we're waiting for the judgment on right now, which is the state of Washington versus Trump. 30 more one signed later. So your Apples, your Amazons, your Facebooks, your Googles, everybody. Now the point is, the, in the space of three weeks, Donald Trump has completely burned up all the goodwill he had with the tech industry. And it's three weeks in, and we've got to put up with four more years of this. It's also worth, met, worth mentioning that 10 former national security officials signed that amicus brief, including two former secretaries of state and the former director of the CIA. The National Security Agency has said this ban serves no national security purpose. But that's the point we need to, to get to grips with. We are no longer dealing with a rational actor. So while we have the US kicking out some of its most vital tech talent, oh, over here, we're also about to lose freedom of movement as well. But here is the policy issue that is keeping me up at night. And it's, it was surprising. And again, it's not something I would have predicted. It's net neutrality. Does everybody know what net neutrality is? It's, it's, it's the policy that decrees that ISPs must treat all data flows equally regardless of the content. This was really a specific American issue where you only have like six or so major ISPs. And some of them own media companies. Some of them own streaming companies. And there was generally a worry that they could start favoring their own content. So Verizon could favor their own Verizon-produced content over Amazon-favored content. That also raised the possibility of companies paying ISPs for privilege. And when net neutrality was an issue of basically whose movie download streams faster, I and a lot of other people basically saw it as a non-issue. This was a real first world problem. Things have changed, and here's why. The regulatory agency that deals with net neutrality is the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. And Trump has nominated Ajit Pai, who's an ex-Horizon executive, who absolutely hates net neutrality and wants to destroy it to run the FCC. In fact, he doesn't just want to destroy it, he wants to defund it. He just doesn't want to put someone who hates net neutrality in charge of the regulator. He wants to get, he wants to get rid of the regulator. So do you think this means that your download of Stranger Things might be slower? No, it doesn't. Gutting net neutrality is not the goal. 
it's the mean to an end. We knew that 45 was going to be really keen on gutting nut neutrality out of this libertarian business thing that ISPs and media companies should be allowed to pay and duke it out and bid to see who comes out on top. That is not what this is about. Net neutrality allows you to throttle communications channels. Net neutrality allows you to throttle messaging platforms. Net neutrality allows you to throttle social media sites. That means what you think it means. Okay? We're going to talk in a minute about user defense, about the things you as developers and programmers need to be doing now, actions you need to be taking. All of the actions we're going to talk about assume the data still flows. This is what's keeping me up at night. So here's a quote from, what is her name? Kate Crawford, uh, writing in uh, Harper's, I believe. You, the software engineers and leaders of technology companies, if you want to transform the world for the better, here is your moment. You, in this room, OK? You made the tools. You see the data. You know what needs to be done to protect the people who have entrusted you with your data, okay? You're not geeks, you're not co coders, you are people of extraordinary power. <coughs> so what do you need to do now? Well, I don't know if you, any of you saw this, but the Reuters news agency, and Trump doesn't like journalists as you know, but the Reuters news agency made an announcement this week to all their staff journalists that they will now practice the skills learned in hostile countries and war zones while reporting on the Trump administration. And what I liked about the way they, they handed this announcement down was they framed it as a positive. They said, don't take too dark a view of the reporting environment. This is an opportunity for us to practice the skills we've learned in much tougher places around the world. Show us what you've got. So here's what I want you to show me. And these guidelines are from the Tor project. These are their 10 principles for user protection for technology in hostile states. Does anyone think we're still not dealing with a hostile state? If so, what's your burden of proof for it being a hostile state? Do you not want it to get to that point? You can see that link for yourself, bookmark it. Um, the Tor Project's rule number one, do not rely on the law to protect systems <laughs> or users. The current threats go beyond law. They go beyond the rule of law. All we are seeing from America right now is an attack on the rule of law. That's why I keep checking my phone. The checks and balances have been eroded. One of the reasons I got into digital law in the first place was I was tired of rolling my eyes at people saying things like, is your website illegal? That isn't how it works. It's nuances and shades of gray. But that argument presumed the law was there to catch you. If you're not following this account, Rogue POTUS staff, please do. I have, I have reason to believe it's legitimate. But what they've said is real concerns starting to emerge that POTUS not even acting as he leads best, just for spite. For example, gutting EU data law because of Obama. We are seeing threats to the fundamental rules and policies and regulations that have made our profession possible out of spite. So don't rely on those laws as your safety net. The Tor Principle's second project is prepare policy commentary for quick response crisis. What does that mean? It means it's down to us. It's down to you and me to counter bad political developments with coherent, proven, technically sound arguments. We have all spent years rolling our eyes at politicians making statements about how the web works or how they should think it works that have no bearing in reality. It's time for us to start rolling our eyes. It's time for your press departments and your vice presidents to get on the news, to get in the media, to say why these things aren't just ethically wrong, why they're not technically sound and not technically possible. And you have to get out of your bubbles. If I see one more person who thinks they're politically active because they posted a meme to their Twitter feed, I'm going to scream. 
Get the hell out of your comfort zone because we all need to do that. Tor Principles' third project is only keep the user data that you currently need. This is about data minimization. This is about data retention periods. This is about data deletion. Start using your imagination really darkly to think how user data could be misused. We're in a travel company right now. And I know that some travel companies, they ask you for your preferences. And let's say you're interested in LGBT-friendly holidays. Let's say a government wants to know all the people who have traveled from a certain country to it that are LGBT. Do you have to stop collecting that data? No, but you have to think, how do I keep that data safe? GDPR will really help with this. I want everyone to get on board with GDPR because it sets out really strict criteria for data retention, for deletion, for data minimization. But you have to go beyond that. Don't use GDPR as your minimum. And oppose any sort of data collection that will predict behavior based on religion, sexual orientation, political preferences, disability, if they did not willingly offer that information. Give users full control over your data. Again, GDPR will help with this. User access to content is part of that. People should be able to download their data. People should be able to uh, delete their data. People should be able to delete their account. But don't wait for GDPR and don't wait for the tick box. Work on this right now, OK? Work on your user interfaces. Work on people being able to download their data as XML or whatever. Kill your dark patterns that make it bloody impossible for people to end a service or delete it. Don't say, we can't delete that data because it would bugger up the forums. Find a way to do it. Allow pseudonymity, pseudonymity and anonymity. Avoid real name policies. Please, please, please don't make it possible to log into your websites using a social media login. Don't punish people using VPNs. Think in terms of user protection, not user obstruction. Encrypt data in transit and at rest. HTTPS is not enough. Sake. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the bigger companies, the representatives of the bigger companies here. Invest in cryptographic R&D to replace non-cryptographic systems. Why does the Tor project want you to do this? Because the US military is the biggest investor in cryptographic R&D. What could possibly go wrong there? This is for companies that are dealing with large amounts of data, but the more effort you put into this, the more it will trickle down to other users. Eliminate single points of security failure, even against coercion. Think of that NASA JPL engineer's phone. How would you personally handle that problem? Sandboxing? Least privilege, data minimization, really, really start to think about every action you take in terms of the data, how you wall it off, how you pass it on, and who receives it. Favor open source and enable user freedom, okay? The ability to use software the ability to study software, the ability to share software, and the ability to improve it. We have all got to start pulling together here and working together. The more you work together, the fewer points of failure you can be. The more bug tickets you can report, the quicker they can be patched. The more people who can raise their hands and say, bloody hell, there's a back door here, the quicker we can sort it. And here's the really, really hard one, because this isn't about your code. This isn't about your skills. This is about what's in here. Practice transparency, OK? Share your best practices. Meetups are like this are brilliant, because as an industry, we need to become less tribal. There's a dozen different languages in here. There's so many different experiences. That's good. But you need to get really tough. When you're told to do something, ask questions. Demand to be told what the tools you are creating will be used for. Demand to know what the data you are collecting will be used for. When your marketing manager says, I want you to require this and this and this and this and this, and this 
Ask your marketing manager if she's conducted a privacy impact assessment of that data against GDPR and watch her face fall. And when she says, yeah, but I want it every day, say no. Get tougher than that. Stand for ethics. When the demands come, get the data, send me the data. Be prepared to say no. Be prepared to resign. Be prepared to delete that data. Be prepared to sabotage it. Because what you have to lose by doing that is a hell of a lot less than the people in that data dump have to lose. Because long after that data is gone, long after 45 is gone, the choices you make are what is going to be remembered. That's my challenge to you, and I wish you the best of luck on it. So if you want to keep in touch with me, that is where you can find me. I've got a newsletter that I will send out tomorrow. Ha uh ha. -huh. Follow me on Twitter. I've also got a couple of upcoming talks. I'm speaking about professional organization in Glasgow on the 23rd, which is the other half of this talk, but we'll deal with that then. Thanks very much. How do we set the time? Five, ten minutes? Five minutes, okay. Five minutes? Right, questions. Yeah. Can you give me a drink from back there? Um, <laughs> I, I think it was Open Rights Group that said, Theresa May is to privacy what a foot is to a door. Um, there's a, you know, it's, it's greatly enabled government sharing across departments, which we're told is for things like, they, they keep using the excuse of fuel poverty. That's, that's like their cover story, that they can find houses that are living in fuel poverty and target them. But it's not about people living in fuel poverty. It's about people on benefits. It's about people who have spent criminal convictions. And slide two, she was hand in hand with Donald Trump. This is someone who sees enemies everywhere. This is someone who's stuck in a siege mentality. Um, and this is why I, I said we need to talk about data minimization, data retention. Assume any data you're putting on a server is theirs. So that's how I feel about it. Have you sold the general public the fact that they don't have the knowledge to protect themselves? No, they don't. No. And you're not going to. You're not going to educate them beyond the most basic tutorials on check the privacy settings on your phone. So it's down to you. I mean, it is literally down to you. The less data you collect in the first place, the less data there is to slurp. Some countries already, like Germany, have very strict uh, data retention policies. You know, where you can and cannot store data. Do you think that other countries should be following suit? I mean, in terms of physical location? Data localization is actually illegal in Europe. Um, but I, I've, I've seen people, you know, businesses in the past three weeks pulling their data out of America. Um, that might be something you want to do. Um, you know, before this time last year, the only major country doing data localization was Russia, which tells you a lot. Um, as I said, don't rely on the rule of law, but if your dad is in Europe, at least you've got GDPR. And Britain is going into GDPR regardless of Brexit. We are going into this new data protection regime. What happens three, four years down the road, that's less clear, but at least get started now. We are still in the EU. We still have those protections. So I wouldn't keep my data in the US right now. There were, there were, you know, isolated cases with journalists. Uh, certainly Glenn Greenwald got pulled off a flight and had his devices searched. But this is different. And we can roll our eyes about why weren't people passionate about these things four years ago, or we can get on with what we have to do now. So that's what I prefer to do. Let's, let's not regret it. I, I actually went and got my MP at her surgery last Friday to talk about these things because I decided I could email her 
but no, she's, she's there. I'm going to go sit down and physically talk with her about this. And I owe her an email now. But um, that, is, that, is, that is something I would say if you're passionate about it. And this is why I, got, I said get out of your filter bubble. Don't rely on petitions. Don't do some automated emailing service and then tweet to your followers, yay, I've been in touch with my MP. Go sit down with them. Like, physically sit down with them and talk about these issues. Searching her email away from the likes of Google mm -hmm. and trying to get that out and where uh, the space comes from. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I was ended up talking to her about was well, yes, you can move your account and your direct data off of quote government uh, email here, uh, but it's still a communication platform and the data that you sort of radiate, send out, uh, ends up in different jurisdictions. That's how the cloud works. As as I said, you've got. As I've said, you've had two U.S. judges in two different districts make two different rulings on that exact question. So the clarity on that question, where the U.S. is concerned, will come down to the Supreme Court which itself is now a question of a Trump nominee. But what I, I would say is you might have seen a few um, months ago, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was before Christmas, there was a petition that went around that was called neveragain.tech, where the leaders of many, many tech companies pledged to participate, that they would not participate in the creation of any databases that could be used to target individuals um, based on religion, sexuality, race, <clears throat> political affiliation, anything like that. And the title of it, Never Again, you, you know where that comes from. And it was a lovely gesture and it was very symbolic, but at the same time it was just as much political theater as anything else because that data is already there. If, if Donald Trump wants a, a database of every British Muslim who's visited the United States on holiday in the past year, he can get it. So this is where we all need to take efforts on an individual level. If the question is, where is my data safest, and you can't be sure of it, delete the data. Take it local. My, que my question is yeah. more, more to do with, uh, yeah. you know, we take our own steps to yeah. protect our own data. What do we do about communication channels and mm -hmm. those that other people choose to use? Mm -hmm. Because obviously cutting off communication on principle of yeah. data protection is not exactly a very wide Encrypt, way. secure, use alternate channels. There's all sorts of um, really good tips going around right now for communications in, in act, for, for, for activists, for people who might be pursued, and I'd encourage you to look them up in terms of encryption, security, secure messaging apps, burner phones. Um, if you're just dealing with everyday, day-to-day -day communications, again, we have to wait to see how the Supreme Court rules. But um, we are in a very scary time right now. I'm not going to, there's, there's no way to get around it. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. If, if recently they've talked about WhatsApp and its collection of metadata yeah. passing on to Facebook. Now, the UK is, <coughs> I believe, they've stopped it in the UK, but it's still carrying on in everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you ask a lot of people, what do you recommend as a secure way to communicate? And they'll say WhatsApp because you can sync it with its transport way. But the metadata is still there in the same way. I know. We I don't have, I think there's a lot of communication tools that are not there to protect people. I know. I know, and it's, it's, it's called the balkanization of the internet, where this beautiful, borderless, worldwide web is now, they enjoy these privileges, but they don't, they have these privacy rights, but they don't. And that was proceeding at a certain pace before this happened. I really hope that wasn't picked up by the mic. <laughs> I heard that, yeah. Um, am I? If anyone's got any other questions, why don't you come see me? Because, as I said, I do have to press off shortly. But thank you so much for listening.